respectable, but the power numbers, just 10 home runs, well off his pace. And I think it's got to the point now, late in July, where he, he looks at the scoreboard and, and is thinking, I only have 10 home runs. I, I've really got to start making some hay. And as a result, found himself really getting out of sorts mechanically. Speaking of which, Vern Rule may be noticing something of the mechanical nature is heading out to talk down Joe Rowan. Well, what he's noticing is here's a guy who relies on control, relies on being successful in getting the ball down. You mentioned not a lot of home runs given up in Triple A. And here in the first, a lot of that adrenaline, a lot of pitches up. Last time he pitched in Atlanta was June of 97. That was pre surgery, that was pre Turner Field. Joe Roy in spring training was released by Florida. He was picked up by the Pirates, traded to the Phillies for absolutely nothing. Not even a player to be named. The indignity of just being charitably donated across state pretty much. The Pirates said, here, take him. Well, in a related story, Julio Franco was acquired from the Mexican League last year by the Braves for a pair of World Series tickets, and John Sherholt said that they couldn't have won it without Julio Franco. 3-0, and, oh, and there's a strike. Scott Rowland, unfortunately, will cost the St. Louis Cardinals a little bit more than that. Although, obviously, that trade that is rumored has not been consummated yet. <laughs> that is Roland standing there at third base currently. From 3 and 0, back to within 3 and 2. With Andrew Jones on deck, and here it comes. A fly ball, center field, Glanville back on that wet track. He will make the catch. Sheffield tagging, heading for third. You saw Vern Rule go to the mound when it was 3 and 0, and we eavesdropped. Fox sounds of the game. Yeah, a little bit in a hurry here. Okay. Two things here. You might be flaring your glove a little bit on the changeup, so okay. make sure these check that so you don't get in a hurry here. I don't want to get into that too much. Then you pick up your target no, down here. Don't get in a hurry. Okay. Remember, respect what you can do. Yeah, but right. he's not looking in. Locate your fastball. Right. Keep the change yeah. speeds. Gotcha. One pitch at a time. Yeah, let's get right. one out. Yeah, come no right back. Keep, you can make sure this pitch. This pitch is sitting on what pitch? Fastball. All right. You got other pitches? Yeah. All right. Mix them up. Let's All go. Right. Kind of a disappointing uh, mound conference. It was G-rated. <laughs> Most of them aren't. But what he was talking about, uh, Bird Rule, about flaring the glove on the changeup. Uh, oftentimes, uh, pitchers will go into the glove with that circle change and open the glove up a little bit more and basically tip that pitch. Andrew Jones to left field and turning around on it is Burl. He does make this catch after missing that pop-up a little earlier. One nothing score. Fox Sports home of the 2002 postseason and World Series returns after these messages from your local Fox station. Now, North Georgia, East Alabama, South Georgia, North Florida. The plain gray of a Doppler 4000 background was all you saw, except for right over Atlanta, a giant red splotch. Never a good sign, the giant red splotch. Most definitely. The 0 2 from Maddox. Make it 1 and 2. Well, Greg Maddox can uh, certainly game plan you to death, but uh, Pat Burrell has made some tremendous improvements since last year a lot of strikeouts last year of course the power numbers up and look at that lock and load position right there very similar to Gary Sheffield as he is triggering it to ready himself into the hitting zone it's like Gary Sheffield light look out that bat goes all the way up and over the Phillies dugout hopefully everybody's okay that thing had some serious action on it
Well, javelin catching and uh, a bat coming into the stands are uh, two hobbies which you, you should probably avoid. No way to predict uh, what this is going to do. The humidity, the rain in the air has a lot to do with that. The slickness on the uh, on the bat, and I think that's the problem. They are booing the fact that the bat is coming back. They are not booing Scott Rowland. I had to check and make sure we weren't in Philly for a minute. Will Scott Rowland be in Philly once his road trip is over, or will he be heading on to St. Louis? Four days till the trade deadline. And all indications are things are pointing that direction. In for a strike two and one. Well, not to get to get ahead of the whole situation. There's a look at Bob Gebhardt, the assistant to the general manager, Walt Jockety for the St. Louis Cardinals, who is even a close eye on Scott Rowland. But you would think that Scott Rowland would be an outstanding fifth uh, for the Cardinals, uh, batting fifth or sixth in that lineup. You have Pujols and uh, Edmonds uh, in front of him, where he's not really riding out front and center as he is here in Philadelphia. And he's really made no secret about his being a Midwest type guy. That is probably where he will end up. Rolling at first base following a rare Maddox walk. It's a game break time. We'll go to Genie's Alaska in L.A. And Josh, everyone's going to St. Louis. That's where we are right now. Cubs already with a 1-0 lead. That only gets a little greedy, but it pays off. The solo home run puts another notch on the board. Two batters later, Jason Simon Tachi hits Mark Bellhorn. Intentional. Well, the warning's issued. And floodgates have opened up. It's the Cubbies big. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Genie. Cubs having a very difficult time winning in St. Louis in recent years. Scott Rowland, as we mentioned, might get to go check out St. Louis pretty soon. Now heading to second base, trying to break up a double play. And maybe he does just that. He goes in hard. It's a fielder's choice. Travis Lee will be the runner safe at first. Well, Rafael for call is... Uh, <laughs> Wondering how he got out of that alive, but uh, Scott Rowland, one of the one of the bigger and harder nosed players, going into second base. He is not going to take it easy on you. I think that's the thing that's misunderstood about uh, Rowland. Every single night, you're getting absolutely his best effort. Knocked out of play by Mike Lieberthal. It could be August 16th, the next time that Scott Rowland sets foot in Philadelphia. That's when the Cardinals are set to come in. He and J.D. Drew could combine to set a new record for jeering in that game at the vet. But as you say, the trade obviously has not been made yet. It is a very hot rumor both in these parts and in St. Louis. You know, and I think Scott Rowland should be celebrated. Uh, jeered in Philadelphia for turning down $140 million over, over 10 years. But what he has done, uh, he's made no bones about wanting to play in the Midwest, be a Midwest-type guy, and that is certainly his right uh, to not accept a huge contract off. And the thing he said in the spring training that I think really sticks in your mind he talked about Philadelphia being the major league's sixth largest market. And Roland saying, my problem with the Phillies is they act like they're small market. Well, he wanted to know if the Phillies were going to make a commitment to, to win uh, long term. Ten years is a, is a long time to sign, even though it's with $140 million attached to it. So I think he is to be commended. One ball, two strikes to count for Maddox. There's so many players nowadays that would really take advantage of that money grab. Some people say it's not about the money. It's uh, that's not what is most important to me. But you get the feeling with regard to Scott Rowland that the money is not what's most important. And if Rowland blossoms fully, I mean, he's already an outstanding player. If he goes to St. Louis and does all that, you watch Greg Maddox out there on the mound today. And Cub fans will tell you, boy, when they had a chance to lock him up long term, why didn't they break the bank to do it? You 
talk about being in full bloom. Greg Maddox has certainly bloomed into a Hall of Famer here in Atlanta. Strokes foul, still two and two to Lieberthal. That is one impressive resume right there. Have to put a wing on the uh, the house where the trophies are, are kept because he has garnered a lot of. Well, you talked about Greg Maddox being handled very carefully this year too. The last time out a two one loss to A.J. Burnett in the Florida Marlins. He was done after 85 pitches, which has pretty much been par for the course this year. Well, he's been very economical with those uh, 85 pitches, so to speak. Lieberthal making him work right here. He just doesn't believe in, in wasting pitches. You see in 2002, 5.75 innings of work per start. They've all but packed him in bubble wrap this year. Well, you know, the Braves knew before they signed him to that extension that uh, he had an arm that could go uh, at any time. He's been so economical with those pitches. He's also had some injuries, the calf, uh, the calf injury along with the back. Lieberthal finally does cash in. He bangs it in a right field, taking the turn as Travis Lee. He'll go to third. Yeah, Maddox was supposed to start against the Phillies back on opening day. He was scratched with a sore back and ultimately went on the DL for the first time in his Hall of Fame career. I think it's a great story to his to his durability. You look at so many guys now who are taking the, the creatine, the protein shakes, the lifting of the weights, and uh, for Greg Maddox, it's, uh, it's a drive through burger and fries, a beer every now and then. He said, if it worked for Babe Ruth, why not for me? Trying to go get the lefty Marlon Anderson right now. Runners at the corners. Braves lead the game 1-0. Not a huge surprise. Strike one. And with Maddox, it's not just all about the Cy Young caliber pitching. You get a few bonuses, too. He has won a gold glove every year since 1990. Plus had batting average in the 250. Look at the Atlanta lineup. Vinny Castilla, Keith Lockhart, Henry Blanco, the three batters that precede him at six, seven, eight in the order. They're all hitting less than what Craig Maddox is hitting at 257. But obviously, it is mostly about the pitching. Luis Gonzalez has called him Picasso. He paints whatever he wants. Whenever he wants. Wherever he wants. Right at the shins of Marlon Anderson. Still one to nothing Braves on Fox. Over the years, I've learned that when something works, you stick with it. There you go. After bypass surgery a few years ago, I needed to lower my cholesterol. My doctor told me about Zocor. He said Zocor, right. along with a healthy diet and exercise, could really lower my cholesterol. Okay, let's do it again. Taking Zocor every day has kept my cholesterol where it should be and significantly reduces the risk of heart attack among people with high cholesterol and heart disease. That's something to feel good about. Zocor is a prescription medication and is not for everyone, including women who are nursing, pregnant, or may become pregnant, or people with liver problems. Your doctor may do blood tests to check for liver problems. Because serious side effects can result, tell your doctor about any muscle pain or weakness you experience and about any medicines you are taking. Good job. When diet and exercise aren't enough, ask your doctor about Zocor. Take care of yourself. It's your future. Be there. Shoes a reflection of the player. See this player? He works the whole court. You're not bringing any noise if you're only dancing half the stage, you know what I'm saying? This guy shows more on D than most show Duncan. But it ain't just about flash. Gotta get the job done. People feel that. 
They can tell he's a winner by how he plays the game. And I can tell how he plays the game by looking at the shoes. Want a close shave while avoiding razor burn? The new Extreme 3 from Schick balances three blades on a central pivot for a close, comfortable shave. Extreme 3. Get close, not burned. Now there's a real prevent defense. Like boom, tough actin' ten actin. Nothing's proven to beat athlete's foot better than ten actin. It's so tough it actually prevents athlete's foot. Lamisole can't say that? No way. <coughs> Get the facts. Get boom, tough actin' ten actin. From the creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Everybody hold on to something. <laughs> Firefly, Friday's Fox Fall. Joe Roa getting the start for the Philadelphia Phillies. The Phillies decked out in the 1980 World Series uniforms. Phillies' only world championship in 120 years of going at it. Can't you just see? Old number 32, lefty Steve Carl. Wearing that uni. Now, Brett Myers in 1980 was just getting born. And he is the next wave of fine young Philadelphia pitching. We look at the Phillies in the standings. Uh, it really has Larry Boa a lot to be excited about for the future, as strange as that sounds. He doesn't feel that they're very far off with the young pitching rotation that they have. The real stark difference between these two teams, I think, Joe, is the bullpens. The Braves absolutely lights out, as you said at the top of the broadcast today. Philadelphia's bullpen ranked 15th. Ground ball to short, the first ball on the ground, induced by Joe Roa today. And Vinny Castillo's the first out here in the second inning. Leo Mazzoni brought up a good point today when he was also talking about how much he likes the, the young pitchers coming up with the Phillies. And in 91, they won it. There he is, the human version of the bobblehead doll, the great pitching coach. When they won it, they won it with a 21-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 23-year-old. That's Steve Avery, Tom Glavin, and John Smoltz. So he doesn't see any reason why uh, next year a little more experience, a little more confidence with the Phillies rotation that those guys the stuff that they have can't do similar things ball and a strike to Keith Lockhart and the young guys took their lumps initially Glavin and Smoltz broke in together in 1988 that is down the line that's fair Keith Lockhart who has been stuck in the mud of late will bust out of a slump as he tears around second he's trying for three and the ball hits him he's safe The Phillies tag him out. Instead, it goes as a triple for Keith Lockhart. Lockhart's a pretty heady player, runs a good route, and I think every intention after passing first base of getting three out of it. He's been struggling at the plate, wants to try to make something happen. And in doing that, You've got a situation where Henry Blanco with a fly ball of any depth can score the run. You don't have to worry about rolling it over necessarily to the number nine spot in the order. Although Maddox at number nine is just fine. But conventional wisdom says if you can get that run in without leaning on your pitcher to do it, you go for it. That's why they bring the infield in and has a lot to do with the on-deck circle. Greg Maddox on the mound doesn't figure to give up a lot of runs. Mike Lieberthal saves what would have been a run producing wild pitch. How many of those do you figure he smothered last night? Probably three or four with the game on the line. Uh, defensively, he is uh, fantastic. Uh, and good catchers, especially with breaking pitches, always ready for a bad one. Well, there's a fly ball. Is it deep enough? Glanville lines it up. Lockhart tagging. Glanville unloads. Safe at the plate. It's two to nothing. Braves do right there what the Phillies have.
struggled to do this year, and that's situational hitting. You have runners on third, less than two outs. You got to make sure you cash it in, get those guys in there. Good, strong throw by Doug Glanville. Makes what I thought wasn't going to be close, uh, somewhat of a play of it. Glanville trying to reprove himself to manager Larry Bowen. Is that a word, reprove? Did I just invent that? Just did. Glanville pretty much being kept on the bench of late. He gets a rarer and rarer start this afternoon. There's a strike to Maddox. Glanville telling us before the game, he's set to go off and play winter ball, go down to Puerto Rico this winter so that he can reprove, if not to Larry Boa, and maybe one of the other major league managers, that he can still do this. That's rare to have an experienced uh, major league player going down to winter. <laughs> Maddox takes a called third strike and can only ask that it goes both ways when he gets back out there. We will see Doug Lanville at the bat when we return. It's 2-0 Atlanta. Hot, humid afternoon. We just noticed Mark Hirschbeck, the home plate umpire, kind of staggering around a little bit, and he is being looked at currently as we get set for the third inning here in Atlanta. I think uh, it was suggested that uh, he take the rest of the afternoon off and uh, kind of said we're not going to do that in uh, a slight deviation from the King's English of course <laughs> and Greg Maddox brownie points if nothing else in there to show his concern well, there's no way he wants to come out of here he's an in, is an intense guy aggressive umpire good umpire and was again telling us before the game how much every umpire looks forward to a Greg Maddox start just like the fans the broadcasters everybody but the opposition and he will refuel here in an attempt to stay in the game with a little bit of grandpa's cough syrup of course <laughs> 9 1 2 in the order here in the third inning for Philadelphia Joe Roa the pitcher then Doug Glanville and Jimmy Rollins a reminder that next week on Fox Saturday Baseball Jim Edmonds and the Cardinals looking to stay atop that NL Central. They take on these Atlanta Braves in a possible playoff preview. Will Scott Rowland be on the Cardinals by then? Some of you might see Jim Tomey and the Indians trying to slow down Ichiro. And the Seattle Mariners who suddenly have some competition in the AL West. It all begins with this week in baseball next week at 1230 Eastern, 1130 Central. Pretty good bellow of strike one for Mark Hirschbeck. That's a good sign. I got to believe Greg Maddox is saying, please, Mark, you got to stay with me because uh, Hirschbeck has the reputation of calling a lot of strikes. And as a pitcher, <laughs> you like to keep those guys happy and keep them around. His brother, John Hirschbeck, same reputation. Hunt for strikes. That's what the memo says. Well, the umpires have been put through it over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Memoed and memoed and memoed some more. Row of fouls one hangs around at one and two. I think it's good to kind of even things out and uh, the, the umpires have been a lot more friendly non confrontational towards managers and the players and uh, we well, hope Mark Hirschbeck can really get through it. He seems to be battling it right now and what they're battling right now is a technology called Questec. Ball is slapped back to the mound. And what Questec is, is uh, laser sightings at home plate uh, and in an effort to, to try to computerize where pitches are located. And it's in every ballpark and it's really being used to evaluate the umpires. It, it laser sightings and, and uh, a lot of mathematical formulas, but it's not an exact science because it doesn't track the ball the last three feet. And so you use that type of technology where it's inexact, it's inaccurate, and it's basically calling a straight plate, and it's going to make the strike zone shrink even smaller than it is right now. Doug Landville bopping one in back of second base. And finally reeling it in is Keith Lockhart battling the sun. Because again, Mark Hirschbeck, the 
apparently is battling the heat and the humidity behind the plate. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Obviously, Major League Baseball wants to get it just right, and you, you don't blame baseball for that. They want to give the umpires the best technology available. The umpires, every game, get discs to put on their laptop computers. They can go back and look at exactly what they did right and wrong. But basically, the technology exists now to all but buzz them or zap them when they, quote, get one wrong. Well, Central Baseball wanted to try to really widen up the strike zone and really call the high pitch. That seemingly has gone by the wayside, but then all of a sudden this technology, which is used as an evaluative tool, that is inexact and basically trying to make the strike zone smaller than it already is. And as a former pitcher, that's not good. Two and one, the count to Rollins. What you hear some of the umpires say is, look, it's like going to medical school. I paid money to become an umpire, to go to school, learn how to do this. Let me do my job. I put a lot of money, sweat, and other things into learning exactly how to do this. Well, what it, what it, what it does is it, is it takes away the aggressiveness of an umpire hunting for strikes. He's thinking about his supervisors, his bosses, uh, the, this Quest Tech stuff, and, and not really getting down to doing what he was trained to do, umpire of all. Still two and two the count to Jimmy Rollins who had a home run last night that interrupted a very deep slump one for 28. Just kind of going through the little bit of the sophomore itis right now where the the league has started to adjust and it's his turn to, to do the same. Attacking that one back to the net. Now Rollins led the National League in steals last year Joe with 46. That total is down to 18 this year. Well, you saw that last pitch. That's what the league basically has been doing, elevating the ball, not really respecting his power, letting him hit a fly ball, hit the ball in the air, especially when they get two strikes. Well, most, most speedy guys like to use the top half of the ball as a, as a reference point. Hit the ball on the ground, stay above it. You're not doing yourself any favors hitting it in the air. Lately, Jimmy Rollins has been Hitting it in the air. Inside corner. Well, he swung at some questionable pitches and then took one that veered over the inside corner. That's it for the inning. Still 2 nothing. It may well be, to quote some Shakespeare now, there will be three umpires in this matter. Doesn't look like Mark Hirschbeck is long to continue this game. He was aided off the field. That is one of the Atlanta trainers, Jeff Porter, that went down there with him. And I'd be surprised, Joe, if Mark Hirschbeck came back out and continued on this very sultry, very humid Saturday afternoon. Well, it is surprising. Maybe he uh, had the flu or something. We talked to him before the game. He seemed fine. He was pumped up, had a chance to be behind the plate, another Greg Maddox start. And you profiled how umpires look forward to those type of things. And if it's possible for an umpire to be a gamer, I mean, Mark Hirschbeck certainly is, and you don't blame him for erring on the side of caution. We've already seen an umpire suffer from heat exhaustion once this year. Of course, there was a tragic death of John McSherry in Cincinnati a few years ago. And you absolutely want to make sure that long-term, Hirschbeck is going to be okay. So it would appear that they'll go with a three-man umpiring crew from this point. Atlanta leading 2 0. We're in the bottom of the third. Greg Maddox on the mound. His Hall of Fame career, as we've talked about, is once again on full display here in the year 2002, leading the National League in earned run average. And I guess since we're talking Hall of Fame, we want to congratulate, obviously, the great Ozzie Smith who will be inducted officially tomorrow along with the wonderful voice of the Philadelphia Phillies, Mr. Harry Callis. Two very deserving guys. Of course, Ozzie Smith really redefined the position of shortstop. You see me? That's giving up that ground ball in the hole. <laughs> and I can guarantee you that Ozzie Smith is going to credit me as his sole reason for being in the Hall of Fame because I threw all those bolts and he ran them all down. 
He was on all the highlight reels making those fantastic plays. I made him a Hall of Famer. <laughs> Way to go. Yeah. <laughs> now Joe Rowe meantime has not been warming up. And a lot of times you will see a pitcher if nothing else just to play a little toss around with his infielders just to stay loose. Uh, I guess the, the Bucky Dent home run in 78 the most famous example of what can happen to you if you don't limber up during a delay. Torres did not do that during that three minute delay when Bucky Dent was limping, limping around fouling one off his foot and the very next pitch made some history went up into the screen. Well on a day like today all Roe has to do is bend over and tie a shoelace and he'll be he'll be ready to go. And, and at this point you're thinking more of, of conservation uh, than you are of, of trying to stay loose. That's certainly not the issue. That's Paul Schreiber. One of the umpires and we're assuming that Hirschbeck's not coming back so either Reynolds or Hollowell will be behind the plate. A brilliant deduction Sherlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think uh, probably Hollowell, Jim Reynolds, does not have the gear on quite yet. So we're assuming it's Matt Hollowell that we're waiting on right now. We'll invite you to come back with us in just a moment. 2 nothing Atlanta, and our second delay of this game. The first one was for a spot thunderstorm that rolled on through. That was a delay of 45 minutes. This one is for waiting for a new umpire, Matt Hollowell, assumably is in there right now getting refitted making sure the protective gear is perfectly in place Mark Hirschbeck the crew chief we are completely comfortable in assuming is done for the day he just did not seem to be in good health as he tried to sweat through it here in Atlanta today as strange as it sounds, it's not difficult to get loose on a day like today, but if you're talking about the two pitchers, Roa and, and, and Maddox, uh, in that mindset, one of, uh, one of conservation, but because you're sweating a lot, even though it is very humid, you do have a tendency uh, with the inactivity uh, to get a little step. Now, you don't figure they're going to go ahead and trade Roland during this delay, do you? Probably not. That is again the big subject at this point. Wither Scott Rowland. Will he continue on as a Philly? Will he be dealt to the St. Louis Cardinals? And now it appears we're getting close to resuming this game. Again, we hope that Mark Hirschbeck is okay. He toughed it out for the last half inning for the top of the third the last thing he did was ring up Jimmy Rollins on a called third strike. He walked off the field under his own power assisted by Jeff Porter the assistant trainer for the Braves. It's going to be Matt Hollowell now as your home plate umpire again this game is two nothing we quickly send it back for a little update in L.A., Jeannie. Josh, they're feeling the heat in St. Louis, courtesy Mother Nature and the Cubbies. Top five, Angel at Javaria. Two-run single, scores Bill Miller and Sammy Sosa. Three RBI in the day for the guy filling in for Mr. Fred McGriff, and it is seven zip Cubbies, bottom five. All right, Jeannie, thank you very much. And the rare misstep by Jason Simon Tachi. What a great story he's been. 28 years old. Fantastic movement on all of his pitches, except for this afternoon. Matt Hollowell smartly attired in a lighter colored shirt. Hopefully a little more reflective. So after about a 10-minute delay, we will get things going again. Top of the order. Rafael Furcal will be followed by Matt Franco and then Gary Sheffield. Again, the Braves with one in the first, one in the second. And Joe Roa twice delayed in this game now. We'll finally go back to work. Hopefully we get a chance to see for call run. Ichiro in the American League and for call in the National League. Uh, two of the premier guys as far as getting down the line. Yeah, you'll get a chance to see him run. And for call thought about advancing to second base. 
Anderson finally did go grab it. Would have been a great play if he came up with it, but I think he is aware of the speed of her call, and he's already taking steps to really quicken himself up to get rid of it. And sometimes that's just enough to take you out of your rhythm. Uh, for call has stolen 16 bases problem is he's been caught 14 times he can run but it doesn't translate into baseball speed baseball speed means you know there may be guys that are a lot faster than you but who gets the better jumps reads the pitchers better runs on the right pitches Christian Guzman of Minnesota probably another good example of that very right. very fleet but it doesn't necessarily translate into stolen bases hasn't really uh, learned how to steal bases yet. Matt Franco, the man at the plate, and a reunion of sorts up there at the plate with Mike Lieberthal crouching it just behind him. Those guys were Little League and high school teammates back in Southern California. Laying out nice play, Travis Lee. Boy, Matt! Matt Franco, who already has a double in this game, was bidding to drive another one into the right field corner. Good play by Lee, a good fielding first baseman, just a little step and a dive, and a shuffle, shuffle off the first base bag. And really didn't have to get full extension. He was able to catch this one with the alligator arm. And get an out. And it brings up the man who has certainly been the offensive catalyst for the Braves. That's amazing. On May 21st, the Braves were 23 and 23, Joe. Stuck in neutral, right at 500. 43 and 14 since then. It's a great comparison, Josh, between these two teams. In that the, the veteran Atlanta Braves team can, with patience, just kind of play their way out of that. The Phillies got off to an 8 and 18 start, and they've been 4 over 500 since then. But haven't really put it together with any consistency. Good pitching will allow you day in and day out to look like a good ball club and to play consistently. And that guy's bullpen has been stellar. You know, in early June last year, the Philadelphia Phillies actually had an eight game lead on these Atlanta Braves. A whirl, a throw back to second base, it gets away. You wanted to see for call run, you have got your wish, Mr. McGrain. It's all about putting pressure on the defense. You have somebody out there who has the reputation of, of good speed. It's into the psyche of the pitcher. He's aware of it. Watch the spin move here. Instead of a, a jump pivot, when you spin, that arm really tends to follow you. And as a result, he just kind of slingshots it into center field. Looked like a ball that, that could have been caught. By Marlon Anderson, who put that pickoff play on. They will have fixed the error to his ledger. He Ford. As Sheffield curls one down the right field line. Everybody running. And Lee reaching out. He couldn't get it. That is his second close call on a foul ball. Joe Rowe is not getting a lot of breaks here. No, he's not. He's not getting some help from the defense. Didn't look like uh, Lee really wanted it. Not to catch that, a bit unsure of himself looking up into the sun. Kind of the uh, the dancing bear routine after this here. It looked like he was more concerned where the wall was. But at the angle that he was running, that wasn't going to be a problem. Had he made the play, you figure for a call, makes a mad dash from third to the plate. Yep. Sheffield looking for a more conventional RBI. Lines one foul hard into the crowd. You know, that brings up an interesting point. Should Travis Lee have dropped that? I don't want to give Gary Sheffield, as good as he's been, uh, another chance to swing the bat. Even if it's going to lead to a run on a sack fly where you can't get, make that throw, you don't want to give that guy another opportunity. The reason he is uh, making all the money on the first and the 15th is because he produces runs. been deflected by Roa on the way there. Well, that ball had eyes for center field, but it ended up in the waiting club of Jimmy Rollins at shortstop. That's your old traditional one to six pop-up. <laughs> 
Sheffield hit it hard. Should have made it right up the middle, and you don't see pitchers with those type of quick reactions reaching over to the backhand side to get a piece of that. And it stalls or leaves for call at third. Football training camps are underway. They're working on the tip drills. Yep. Not getting a lot of help from the defense behind him. Joe Roa literally assisted right there. Chipper Jones to right. Abreu going back. It's gone. A home run for Chipper Jones. Only his 11th this year, Joe. He had only one in the last five weeks. Quote Shakespeare a second time in the inning. Delays have dangerous ends. They certainly have for Joe Rowe today. Well, through Chipper Jones' struggles, he has not been driving the ball, but look at that first that bat that he had. He really stung the ball, hit it to the wall over the center, uh, at, at center field. And gets another good pitch, a hanging breaking ball. A hanging breaking ball is you really don't have to, to really do a whole lot. Just make a good pass through the zone. And it was playing pinball out in the bullpen. Andrew Jones squibbing one foul. Chipper Jones really needed that. He was saying, holy cow, Chef, I finally picked you up. <laughs> it's remarkable that Chipper and Vinny Castilla have only now combined for 20 home runs. But that last soaring shot by Chipper. Terry Pendleton, the hitting coach, uh, we saw the sound bite earlier about Gary Sheffield talking about no egos, and certainly looks like that's the case there. Said that he even brought Chipper Jones's father, Larry Jones, in to look at Chipper's swing to try to help him. And he made some suggestions to Terry Pendleton and to Chipper for some things to work on. Ground ball to short. Well, then the inning. Two runs. Two hits, two home plate umpires, two Shakespeare references in the inning. Four nothing, Atlanta. Yeah, nobody else before Greg Maddox. He's also so intuitive when he is not pitching, sitting in the dugout. He'll warn uh, guys when there's a foul ball coming their way <laughs> by watching the bat. Oh, that's a good pitch. Greg Maddox thought so from his body language. And now Greg is saying, where are you, Mark Hirschbeck? Ball seemed to boomerang back towards the inside corner. Maddox says the heck with it. Let us throw up some more nasty stuff. Pat Burrell is down on the strikes. Four strikeouts for Maddox against one walk. Talk about the intuitiveness of Greg Maddox. Everything he throws breaks away from the middle of the plate with great movement doesn't give you a lot of pitches to lean on that's a good pitch again trying to carve up that corner but Matt Hollowell said no go and again a uh, former pitcher so you got to have that <laughs> 2 and 0 the count you know what's incredible is a couple of years ago Greg Maddox all season you say he had 11 2 0 counts in 30 starts. He doesn't go 2 0 often. Roland ends up tagging a base hit on that very count. You don't want to get into a thinking game with Greg Maddox. There's a 2 0 pitch. Uh, Roland does a little bit of zone hitting, thinking he's going to see something on the outside part of the plate. This one just has a little bit more plate than Greg Maddox would like. And Scott Rowland, who really considers himself a middle of the field guy, up the middle, did exactly that. First pitch strikes to just about every hitter in this game, save for two. You know, Josh, I had some Braves pitchers, and I, I still really don't believe it, don't buy it. I think they're playing possum that they said that Maddox sometimes uh, gives up hits in situations where it's not going to hurt him in an effort to, to set up hitters. You, you don't. 
I, I, I don't buy into it. There's two outs, and he walked Roland, truly pitched around Roland the first time up. Two outs, 2-0 two count, and he just seemed to serve one to the uh, middle away part of the plate. Maybe there's something to it. He's given up a pair of two out singles today. But you do hear that about him. His teammates say he'll probably never throw a no hitter. Mainly because he doesn't care about it. He's looking to get guys to put it in play. Let the defense do the work. And as you say he doesn't mind instilling a false sense of security. By allowing a guy to get a hit on a certain pitch. Early. I don't think he meant to do that. He goes to 2 0 on Travis Lee, and again, the Philly belts one into the outfield. It is runners at the corners. And a pretty dangerous hitter coming up in Mike Lieberthal. It gives, uh, gives us an opportunity to really take a look at this scenario in that having to make your best pitches out of the stretch. Well, there's two outs, and he's in somewhat of a jam. Now he gave up a two out single to Lieberthal in the second inning. And that is the personal catcher of Greg Maddox, Henry Blanco, that goes out to have a word with him. Used to be Paul Bacco, used to be Eddie Perez. This year it's Henry Blanco. Bacco, Blanco, Blanco, Bacco. Yep. It's like the old Letterman bit with Oprah and Uma. Neither of whom can catch as well as Henry Blanco. Now there's the first pitch strike, 0 and 1. Javi Lopez was thought to be headed to the disabled list, but he is now saying he thinks he can keep soldiering on. But you don't see Lopez catching Greg Maddox starts. You usually do see somebody else. Instead of 2-0, and oh, it is 0-2 to Lieberthal. You know, a lot's been made. Uh, does Greg Maddox have a, have a problem uh, throwing uh, to Javi Lopez? Uh, in typical Maddox fashion, he says uh, a frontline catcher is going to catch about 125 games, and I'm going to have around 33, 35 starts. And the backup catcher is, is going to get in there about you know, 40 sometimes. I just... Happened to fall on the days when the backup <laughs> catcher's in there. He's just trying to help, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, you've never heard him say anything pointed or anything that would lend you to believe that he's got anything personal against Javi Lopez. But the fact of the matter is, Lopez never catches his starts. Yeah, now, don't uh, misconstrue this, but I think on a lot of clubs, the number two catcher is the better defensive catcher. The number one guy a lot of times is the number one because of his bat. And the number two catcher is always trying to prove himself as a number one and thinks better than the number one catcher who's out there in a grind. Just off the plate two and two. The Rangers a pretty good example of that. Bud Rodriguez has a cannon arm and a home run bat. But in terms of handling a pitching staff the guys all call for Bill Hassel the backup. Number two guy's always trying to prove himself, and he is with you more often on every pitch. 2-2 two, two is hit in the air to left field. Chipper Jones will put it away on the track. The Phillies strand a couple. It is still 4-0 for Maddox and the Braves. Near me to the red. Protection for Adam Dunn hitting right before I'm done with a solo home run. Top six. Getting the Reds on the board, evening things up. It's Dunn's fourth home run in his last seven games, and we're all tied up. Bottom six, Josh. Adam Dunn. What an unbelievable talent he is. A massive human being, too. Was he about six foot 13? Yeah, he sleeps in the kitchen with his feet out in the hall. <laughs> Two balls, no strikes to count to Lockhart. But he does things that mere mortal men do. I mean, he runs well. It's like he simply got supersized. Anderson will guide it on to first. And two quick outs here in the inning. We get you back to the RadioShack.com 
trivia question. Ozzie Smith, the winner of 13 consecutive gold gloves at short. The last Philly shortstop to win one. He is in attendance today, wearing the uniform style of 1978 when he won it. Larry Bowen. It's a great era of shortstops. Can you find him? Can you find him? Yeah, that would be him. His lips weren't moving, so right. kind of difficult to isolate him there. I'm saying a great era of shortstops in the National League. There's a look at the 13-year-old picture of Larry Boa. Ozzie Smith, Dave Concepcion, Larry Boa, all great shortstops, really redefining how the position was played on turf. See him go into the hole and, and one-hop the first baseman off the turf uh, deliberately. Played a lot deeper, played the position differently, and really it's played today. He would do well to have a seat belt in that dugout, though, now, you know, as a manager. Still very active. Blanco shooting one to left. You know, the great story about Larry Boa, the scout that signed him, never actually saw him make a play in shortstop, never saw him swing the bat. The scout had shown up to see him play. He DH'd in game one. Boa was ejected from that game for, guess what, bench jockeying in the top of the first. Game two, he gets all over the same umpire. Again, shoots off his mouth, gets run before he even takes the field. So all Boa's coach could do was borrow a film projector, string up a bed sheet. And they ran the projector to show the scout how he really did look on the field. Well, Larry is uh, somewhat irascible, especially when you're playing against him. I remember when he was the third base coach with the Phillies. I had to go back up bases. I spent all my time acting like I was looking at the ball in the outfield and trying to run him over. <laughs> and he would always uh, sidestep me at the last moment, <laughs> but uh, kind of knew what my intentions were. Maddox spins one towards the crowd. And uh, he's jumping up and down and, uh, and cheering and all kinds of uh, gesticulations and in typical Larry Boa fashion. Uh, very intense. Guy you would love to have on your team and hate to play against. And if not a Hall of Fame player, certainly a Hall of Fame bench jockey. That's a lost start, and that's mm -hmm. really too bad. You don't hear a lot of that anymore. And his victims would respond by calling him Pee Wee, but that's really about all they could do. Because he'd go out into the field and back it up. Make every play it short. Maddox flicking one again towards the crowd right side. One of those glory years in Philadelphia, they had uh, a great left side defense. You had Mike Schmidt uh, at third, Larry Bow at short. Great Steve Carlton throwing those sliders down and in. And if they put it in play into the teeth of a uh, of a great defense. Larry Boa said something today that was very surprising. He said that Scott Rowland is the best defensive third baseman he's ever seen, and that includes Mike Schmidt. Wow. I thought they didn't like each other. Hmm. Maddox popping out. The inning is over. It is still 4-0. We'll play the fifth here on Fox. Another show. Joe Roa has waited five years for this start. You know he wants to continue. Fox sounds of the game. We're going to hit for you just because we got, you know, we, got, we make oh. a couple plays. It's right. two runs. Right. And you'll get another we'll start. In five days. You're going to get right back out there. Come out there and back start. All right? Pitch better is what the results are. Okay? We just need, we need to hit for you. We need to get a couple guys in the pen. We get some work. So, okay. Stay with us. And that will happen right away. Marlon Anderson has just swung at the first pitch. He just grounded out to second base. So this was going to be Joe Roa hitting right now. It will not be Joe Roa. Well, that was a great little sequence there because he took something uh, that was negative and, and turned it into a positive. Both Hurtful and Larry Bow. Uh, he wants to stay in there and get a chance to hopefully have his team get some runs. Scott Rowland congratulating him, knowing. And if they caught the ball a little bit better, as Larry Boa said, should be two to nothing as opposed to four to nothing. So it is Ricky Lede at the plate instead. Had a couple of hits in the game yesterday. Joe Roa 
And you heard it right from Vern Rule. He will get another chance to go out there and prove himself in five days. You see how how well that was handled in that uh, a lot of times you just say that's it you're done without any explanation we're going to hit for you and here's why nice job Two on delivery to Ricky Lede is up and in. We have seen Greg Maddox with a pair of two and O counts and now a three and one count. Anybody else but Greg Maddox, that's not news at all. That tends to happen to pitchers, but not usually to Maddox. And on three and one, that ball smoked towards center field. Andrew Jones is back. It is off the wall and into a puddle. Lede cruising into second base. Uh, twice on two and zero, oh, and now once on three and one. Maddox has given up hits in this game. First time to Scott Roll, and this time to Ricky Lede. Three one gives into the strike zone a bit, a little more plate than Maddox would normally allow, especially if he was ahead in the count. Doug Glanville comes to the plate. Now Doug Glanville has been up twice. He has seen a total of two pitches which is why he doesn't lead off every day anymore for Larry Boa. Larry Boa talked about his concerns. Uh, on base percentage has not been good. Leaving runners stranded is something else that's been somewhat of a habit for the Phillies. He swings at the second pitch this time. Chipper Jones coming in. Two down in the fifth inning. That is always a question about Doug Glanville. Can he get on base enough to really be a factor? Last year, Joe, 153 games. He walked only 19 times, which is just unacceptable for a leadoff hitter. Typical leadoff guy you'd like to see with a high on-base percentage, very selective, someone who's comfortable hitting with two strikes that can foul off a lot of pitches, take a lot of pitches, work the count. We'll throw a caveat into the mix. I lettered in caveat throwing in high school. Mm -hmm. If you're Lenny Dykstra and your batting average is 337, you don't have to walk a lot. But if your batting average is 227, you have to take a walk. One ball, one strike to count to Rollins. So you see some of the genius of uh, Greg Maddox's pitching. Uh, his landing foot when he's throwing inside or outside he has basically two different stride points a lot of pitchers land basically in the in the same spot but he does not basically about a half foot width of a difference whether he's going inside or outside or on that bit you bet harmless little ground ball that will end the inning so yeah they hit Perroa to get some offense and they got a double from the day but they couldn't cash him in Four to nothing Atlanta. We've had a 45 minute rain delay in this one. We have had a 10 minute umpire not feeling well delay in this one. We now have Real Cormier on the mound. French for journeyman left hander. Real, don't call me Frenchy Cormier from New Brunswick. You, you see a lot of bilingual players uh, these days, but uh, not too many who speak English and French. French is uh, first language. Is the language of love. That's exactly right. But not a lot of practical applications in this game, though. You're right. Mm -hmm. Raphael for call. Matt Franco, Gary Sheffield scheduled in the inning. Although Matt Franco has only had one at bat off the lefty all year. We might not see him. Cormier has a, a real good moving fastball. He's real, real wristy, real, uh, real flippy with the wrist. Gets a lot of uh, movement on his pitches. Has a good split finger fastball. Another one of those guys who have had elbow reconstruction and, and seem to come back better than they were before. The Phillies with two pitchers used today, both of them having gone through the Tommy John surgery process. The bunt from Furcal, looking for his 20th bunt hit of the year. He comes up a little short. You know, Tommy John had Tommy John surgery. How in the world could he not see that coming? 
Nice idea by for call. Let me get the pitcher off the mound. Now we will indeed get a pinch hitter for Matt Franco. Wes Helms will take over instead. Hit a big beefy righty up there to face the lefty Real Cormier. Well, Matt Franco, one of the uh, great feel-good stories for the Braves this year, coming from the Mets. Talked to him in spring training. He said, I don't know any of these guys. They just come, they do their work, and don't say much. It's unusual that, uh, well, not unusual, but interesting that Matt Franco's uh, uncle is Kurt Russell, the actor, and Franco played for the Mets last year, so truly an escape from New York. <laughs> uncle Kurt can play him in the movie. The Matt Franco story. And it is a pretty cool story, too. I mean, he played triple-A ball last year, all year. Has gone from being a spare part in Norfolk to a key part in Atlanta. There goes Helms, driving it to left. It's off the bottom of the wall, and he's going to try for two. He is going to make it as he bowls over. Anderson hits second base. Sure looked like a double off the bat, but because it ricocheted so quickly, back to Pat Burrell, you had a shot to get him at second base. Hit right at the base of the wall down there where it's not springy from the, from the pad and it allowed Burrell to make a good strong throw. Wes Helms, the bread truck coming into second base. <laughs> You've gotten both wristy and springy in in this inning. Yep. It's like itchy and scratchy almost. Okay, now I just barely gave you a concussion here. Hey, you all right? There was a helping hand that came in there. One strike to count to Sheffield. Sheffield doubled in a run back in the first, so that on-base streak continues. 52 consecutive games. This one towards center. Glenville on the run. Will pull it in. Well, it's a good thing Glenville got it there because he got that ball right before it started to rise. <laughs> Sheffield hit one hard last time, too. And that one had gone for an out. He went back disappointed to the dugout. Remember the deflection? And then he talked about it afterwards. Fox sounds of the game. You don't see that. Huh? You don't see that before. I ain't never seen that. <laughs> 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 and then Fuka didn't run. That's a, that's a, a surprise. Well, if you saw the movie Airplane, you might want to bring in Barbara Billingsley for the translation, but it was peculiar. Chipper Jones takes it a little bit too far inside. Strange play indeed. But the Braves haven't really needed that. They've had some things go their way. It is four to nothing. Off speed, sporting outside. Chipper Jones, a home run in the third inning. So he's now got 11. Well, maybe that's the one uh, to get him going because it's been a dry spell. It's spring training, Joe. I tell you that. Greg Maddox is only giving the Braves about 80 pitches a start. Castilla and Chipper are on pace for about 16 home runs apiece. As you see, they'll go ahead and put them on now. But in late July, I tell you, Atlanta's going to have a 12 and a half game lead. The other thing that's uh, very interesting about that is how well the bullpen has been for Bobby Cox. And the thing that's important for a manager is the starters have done such a good job that these guys can come in and pitch in their roles. They're not going out there to suck up innings. The bullpen has been beyond solid for the Atlanta Braves. That's why you can lift Greg Maddox and protect him after 80-odd pitches. It's going to be Darren Bragg coming on to pinch hit here. Andrew Jones do. I wonder uh, on that uh, double 
over his head by Ricky Lede if uh, if Andrew uh, tweaked anything. Uh, he had kind of a funny break going back to the back to the wall. It's still a wet warning track because of that massive thunderstorm that ended up delaying the game at the outset. But yeah, Andrew is now done for the day. This is Darren Bragg instead with two on, two out. And Andrew Jones, your big time RBI guy, leads the team in home runs and runs batted in. Normally you'd want him up there no matter what. Pinch hitters in this game, by the way, two for two with two doubles. So the pressure is on Darren Bragg. And obviously we'll try and get you an accurate portrayal of what's going on with Andrew Jones, whether it's serious or not. Pass the mound. And bobbled, and then paddled, and the bases are loaded. That's going to be the second mishandled ball by Marlon Anderson in this game. Talking with Larry Boa before the game, uh, and Philly's really riding a four-game winning streak, but it's this type of inconsistency that, that has really led to the, the, the frustrations this year. They'll, they'll put a couple games together, and all of a sudden, uh, as a team, be unrecognizable from the past few games. They have uh, not caught the ball well this afternoon. A pair of errors charged to Anderson today. And Castilla sends one hard but foul with the bases loaded here in the fifth. And a chance for the Braves to simply run away from Philadelphia right now. They've got Greg Maddox. You figure with another inning left in him, He's at 75 pitches for the afternoon. Maddox has not gone past 97 pitches in any start this year. And as you mentioned, Joe, with that bullpen, the Braves haven't needed him to. Ground ball, third base. Rolling with a mishandle. He recovers. Got him at first base. Scott Rowland, and you don't blame him if he's a trifle distracted this afternoon. Trade talk swirling, but he recovers, makes a great throw. It's still 4 0. Sorry, I got that receipt in here somewhere. His foot placement for a pitch on the inside or the outside part of the plate. Now, he, taking a look at the grips, there's the fastball here and then the cut fastball there, but he throws everything on the center of the baseball. That ball drilled by Burl, but foul. And talking about throwing on the center of the baseball, when a pitcher will go in or on the outside part of the plate, a lot of times they'll throw the outer third of the ball or the inner third of the ball. But he'll just alter the grips, but keeps everything in the middle because he has that foot placement that allows him to pitch with movement on both sides of the plate. And it's that type of pitching tenant that Leo Mazzoni talks about that Greg Maddox has helped the other pitchers make great improvements. Kevin Millwood used to have a, a great moving sinker, but just on one side of the plate. But alternating the foot placement, it's allowed him to have that movement on both sides of the plate, meaning inside to left-handers to lock him up like he did Abreu. A lot of pitchers can have that movement only on one side of the plate. Maddox has it on both, and the key to it all is his foot placement. Just about a half of a foot width apart. Seems very subtle, but it pays big dividends in the, in the hitting zone. Can I borrow your sunglasses, by the way? Those look really cool. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot out of what you just said, but I just the sunglasses really work for you. <laughs> the one, two, got him. At the shins of Pat Burl. Two strikeouts in the inning, six for the game. And a hat trick today for Burl. He gets so many strikeouts looking, and that has a lot to do with the movement on his pitches. Now, you'll see very subtle. It's hard to tell here, but those are the two landing spots right there. A lot of pitchers just have one footprint. Maddox has two. And there he is going to the outside part of the plate. It makes so much sense and not surprising that it's coming from Greg Maddox and that he's equated it into such a, a simple way. You step and uh, your body follows where you step. And a lot of pitchers just step in the same place. And he steps in two different spots 
and that's why he has such good movement on both sides of the plate. Two and zero to Scott Rowland for the third time today. Rowland is the one Philly who has made it on base twice this afternoon. How about the top of the order? You know what's before Rowland? They are a combined 0 for 12. Come on back, Mr. Rowland. Three and one. You know something I would pay to watch this guy play. Uh, the effort you get from him every single night. And again, Larry Boa, who has had a bristly relationship with Scott Rowland at times, says uh, from an effort standpoint, he again is better than anyone he's has ever seen. Well, if you want to pay to see him, see you in St. Louis, Louis. That is the hot rumor of the day. And I think in Philadelphia, they just had such, and they still do have high expectations for Scott Rowland. He's a, uh, he is a, he's a very good player. But the people in Philadelphia have, have expected a lot more out of it. Did he go? No, sir. Third time that Roland has worked his way on against Maddox today. Bob Gebhardt, the special assistant to Walt Jockety in St. Louis, watching on an interested observer. Next week on Fox Saturday Baseball, Jim Edmonds, maybe Scott Roland, and the Cardinals look to stay atop the Central. They take on Chipper Jones and the Braves. Chipper's not going anywhere. Or Jim Tomey and the Indians trying to slow down Ichiro and the Seattle Mariners. Or there's other regional action, too. It all starts with this week in baseball. Next week at 12.30 Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Central here on Fox. Now Chris Hammond is in the Atlanta bullpen and assumably ready to go. Greg Maddox, 85 pitches in each of his last two starts. is just a shade past that today. He's at 88. Well, Josh Rollins reached uh, all three times. Two walks uh, for Greg Maddox against Scott Rowland. Uh, regardless of the four-run lead, there's two outs, and you already mentioned in front of Rowland, the guys have not swung the bat all that well. Maddox certainly aware of that. He's going to take his chances with this guy, Travis Lee. Maddox online for win number 10. Against just three losses. He has only allowed six home runs all year. Runner goes. Blanco firing down there. It is too late. Scott Rowland, the surprise stolen base, his fifth of the year. Well, for all the things that Maddox does well, holding runners, probably uh, not one of his strong suits. Good jump by Rowland. For a big guy, runs very well and runs hard. And again, the rumor is he might be getting traded in the next 48 hours. He's out there taking out base runners. He's stealing bases. He is certainly not protecting his personal investment. I mean, he's out there trying to win a game. Well, something else to just kind of take it in a sideways direction. You have the great Harry Callis uh, with the Phillies going into the Hall of Fame this weekend. And uh, you wonder if that will be tabled a little bit uh, to not diminish from Harry's weekend. I, I think you're right on with that, Joe. I think that the Phillies always PR conscious and they need to be. I mean tomorrow the headlines I think they think should read Harry Callis is in the Hall of Fame. The headline should not be about where Scott Rowland is going. Right. They do have until the 31st to complete a trade. That ball drifting inside three and two to Lee. And for what we're hearing it would be three players going to Philadelphia with Rowling going uh, to St. Louis with the contingency that they could talk to him and get a multi-year deal worked out. They don't want to just have him as a rent me for a couple of months. Tagged into right field. We'll see if the stolen base leads to a run. Right now, Sheffield throwing in. And it does lead to a run. Scott Rowland. Travis Lee singles him home. It is now a 4-1 game, and since you talked about a Harry Callis, it is our distinct pleasure to show you a little bit of Harry Callis, a legendary Phillies announcer.
unbelievable. The voice of baseball for really a couple of generations of Philadelphia fans. Well, don't forget in uh, Harry also the voice of NFL films. You saw when Harry was lighting up a stogie. That was his uh, great friend Whitey Richie Ashburn who passed away. Another Hall of Famer. One strike pitch to Lieberthal. And really sad that Richie Ashburn uh, couldn't see Harry Callis go into the Hall of Fame because he would have been very proud. Longtime partner Chris Wheeler there in Cooperstown with him this weekend to lend some support and cheer on it. the great Harry Callis joined the Phillies in 1971 did Harry. Makes the rest of us sound like tiny Tim. Mm hmm. Let's say Harry and James Earl Jones are pretty much the best voices ever. One ball two strikes and the guy that does all the Fox promos too. I forget his name. Jack Buck and Harry Callis give a lot of credit to those great voices from taking up smoking at a young age. <laughs> <laughs> Not advocating that but. One, one and two. Lieberthal strokes it towards the right field corner. This ball is curling and it goes barely foul. And you're right. That's not advocating. That's just uh, relaying a quote. Now when Harry Callis sang at Wrigley earlier this week the entire Phillies dugout was out of the dugout to watch and listen. The deep dulcet bass voice of a man who now deservedly so is a Hall of Famer. Phillies making Mr. Maddox work for it here. The one two pitch to Lieberthal is in too snug two and two. And could it be that Greg Maddox will have to actually throw a hundred pitches this afternoon. I guess the answer is yes he's at 99 we're told right now this is the high pitch count for the year. On a sweltering afternoon. We are told by the way that Andrew Jones left the game with a dizzy spell. And Mark Hirschbeck the home plate umpire had left the game in the third. He informs us. That he was actually not feeling well before the game. Although he masked that pretty well when we went down and talked to him. There's a ground ball to first. Look at that. It goes crazily away from Helms. It's going to be first and third with two out. And suddenly, the Phillies have the tying man at the plate. We well, are, that's we, got to be caught. Well, there was some bizarre English on that ball. But you're right. Wes Helms needs to get the body down to block it. Watch his feet. He gets his feet all tied up. It's, uh, it's almost like he's got his right hand going into his left pocket. Going two directions at once. And that apparently is going to be it for Greg Maddox. Should have been out of the inning, but he is not out of the inning. The Phillies have chased away the ace. New pitcher coming on when we come back. Well, the inning began with Greg Maddox striking out Abreu and Burl, but then a walk, a stolen base, a single, and an error. And now it's goodbye, Maddox. Hello, Chris Hammond. Chris Hammond is uh, is a dart thrower from the left side. You know, Bobby Cox and Leo Mazzoni would just as soon throw away the radar gun and just collect a lot of guys who can pitch. And so far, Chris Hammond, like a lot of the guys in the Braves bullpen, have been doing a lot of that. And it's interesting with Marlon Anderson at the plate to face him. Anderson has already committed two errors in this game. And only a generous official scorer prevented it from being three, really. He's got a chance to tie this game right here. Can change his day in a hurry. Anderson 0 for 2 at the plate. And the pitcher's spot follows. So if you're thinking timely hit. And this is exactly that realm here for Philadelphia. The 
Michigan to the crowd a one and one and you know we've talked a little bit about this Atlanta bullpen <laughs> which in its last 28 innings has allowed just one earned run. That's a, that is just amazing. I tell you what's amazing about that is you have uh, a lot of these guys and they've been on other ball clubs are comfortable pitching with the lead and in tight situations and they're not giving it up. That ball slashed into center. It is a base hit. The run is charged against the ledger of Greg Maddox. So indeed Anderson makes up for his miscues a little bit. Cormier was on deck. He's being called back. As the Phillies continue to chisel away here in the sixth inning. Hammond misses this spot, leaves it middle, middle. So it's two on, two out. And Jason Michaels apparently is going to be the pinch hitter. Rare misstep by the Atlanta bullpen. You know, really, they only had three proven commodities to start the year. They had Smoltz, they had Leitenberg, they had Remlinger. The rest, kind of a patchwork quilt of vagabonds, all of whom have done very well. A lot of people have been well traveled as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he pitched to Michaels. He is in here for a strike. Hammond's best pitch is probably the changeup, mm -hmm. and which is a, a pitch that actually he would prefer to throw to right-handed hitters than left-handed hitters. He can get a little more offensive with it to the righties. There's two of them. For two strikes. You talk about vagabonds. Here's a guy in Chris Hammond that a couple of years ago was retired. Mm -hmm. Figured he was done with baseball. He retired to... The South Paul Ranch in Alabama. That's in Widowie, Alabama. And he commutes in from there for every Braves home game. It's a 90 minute drive. Well, I saw the mule team out uh, <laughs> out back. <laughs> that is some kind of commute. Well, he's left handed and he's got himself a Cuban birth certificate so he can pitch as long as he wants. <laughs> Michaels fires one back to the net. Still one and two. That's 90 minutes in in the morning, 90 minutes home after the game for the quiet bliss of Eastern Alabama. Good for him. Again, the one two and that is softly dealt outside two balls, two strikes. Well, Hammond is one of those guys that if he was right handed, uh, he wouldn't be in baseball. Because he is left handed. With that good off speed pitch. Pitching great. Does not get Michaels to bite. One off speed pitch after another. Now it's three and two, and now these runners will be on the move. They'll be on the move, but he threw that pitch 2 2, so you would think that he could throw it 3 2, especially now with the runner not wanting to take a call third, made a little bit more aggressive. He could throw that exact same pitch. And perhaps get a swing at him. Top of the order on deck. There they go, and here it comes. Ball four. Doug Glanville, a chance to make a difference now. All of this happening with two out. Remember, Abreu and Burl had each taken a called third strike from Greg Maddox. You know, we talked about it right off the top that it's shaping up now into being a prototypical Braves ball game where Bobby Cox has gone to the bullpen in the sixth. They have the lead. They've been great all year. If Doug Glanville swings at the first one this time. And he doesn't. I was going to say Larry Boa might actually physically come out on the field and haul him back into the dugout. Glanville had seen four pitches in three prior at bats and following it the walk to the pinch hitter. You better believe that the assignment was to go up there and take at least one. Tim Spoonie Barker. Not as easy as Roa to fit on the back of a jersey by the way. Joe Roa went four innings for the Philadelphia Phillies. Royal Cormier went one. 
we will see a third Philadelphia pitcher when we finally get to the bottom of the sixth inning. But Joe Rowe is still a very interested observer. Hammond needs to throw a strike. He does not. And this is an awfully tough guy to walk. We've talked about this already today. Doug Glanville is being held out of the lineup most days because he doesn't walk. And now you're not asking him to be, well, you are asking him to be selective, but he should get a real good pitch to hit. That one finding the inside black, two and one. Hammond's best pitch is the change up. Does he have enough courage to throw it here? Fastball over to third and right to the bag. The Phillies have stranded eight, but they have scored a couple. They have chased away Maddox. This is a 4 2 game. 4-2 Atlanta with David Coggin now on the mound, becoming the third Phillies pitcher of the day. We take a look at our fan camp presented. If all goes well for Joe McGrain, a 6 p.m. flight from Georgia. We had a 45-minute rain delay at the start of this game. I would answer to the name Night Train, though. <laughs> Night Train McGrain? That is kind of catchy. Dave Coggin, no nickname. 2-2, two and two, 4.89. Good heavy fastball, 91, 92 miles an hour. Curveball, knee-buckling curve, probably his best pitch. I got a nickname for him, the Cogster, mm. the Coginator. How's that? Yeah, I think that'll stick. I think they'll be printing T-shirts like in an hour. Even as we speak. <laughs> two balls, two strikes to count. Of course, he's another one of those young, talented pitchers. As I mentioned early in the ball game, the Phillies uh, are not doing too well in the standings this year, but Larry Boa does not think that they're that far off. Uh, they're resigned to the fact that Scott Rowland's not going to be with him next year. Nice job by the Cogmeister. It's Keith Lockhart. And one down here in the sixth inning. So the Phillies have steered out of the skid, if nothing else. 27 and 22 since June 1st. And Joe, that includes 18 and six on the road. And they, they started out this year as possibly the worst road team since the Washington Generals. They were five and what, 22 on the road. Philadelphia has uh, has it been a great place to play and sometimes a very difficult place to play, especially the way the Phillies have got off to a slow start, eight and 18. And obviously the fans uh, get a little frustrated, and it can be a difficult place to play. If you don't believe that, ask Mike Schmidt. So I think <laughs> 18 and 6 on the road uh, shows you how difficult it can be at home when you're not playing well. Mike, Sch or Mike Schmidt's great line, Philly, the only city where you can experience the thrill of victory and the agony of reading about it the next day. They've been known to boost Santa Claus there. <laughs> they have not exactly gotten behind Scott Rowland this year. Blanco trying to check his swing. And he does, two and two. But I heard that the Philly fans were misunderstood uh, with regard to the booing of Santa Claus. It's not booing Santa Claus. It's the guy's costume was uh, ragtag and, uh, and really didn't look well at all. And that is what they were booing. 
not the actual Chris Kringle. That's correct. That would be in very bad taste. That was Euchre's line that threw the crack in the Liberty Bell. But not when they're playing well. I mean, you know, that's... There's one very easy way to get everybody on your side. That's to actually have a winning season or two. In there. And Coggin has struck out another against Blanco. Now, if you think you can hit a Randy Johnson fastball, you are invited to take your best shot with FoxSports.com and hit the pros. A revolutionary new home run game where you face the exact pitches thrown here today. Step into the batter's box after the broadcast. Go to FoxSports.com on Lycos. Keyword to hit the pros. You know what's uh, interesting about that is I would bet that Greg Maddox would be just as difficult to hit solidly as Randy Johnson. <laughs> For a very different reason, you're right. Yeah. Chris Hammond down on the count 0 and 2. Coggin, a chance to strike out the side here. Not yet, 1 and 2. Boy, Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling continuing to be just an incredible one-two punch. Arizona's got a four-game lead in the West. Those guys continually amaze me because they're power pitchers and really thrive on adrenaline, getting to two strikes and finishing hitters off and really having to have that max-out fastball to put hitters away. And uh, one through nine innings, uh, their durability and being able to do that is it's just amazing. From 3 0 to 3 and 2, and now here it comes. Wow, he walked the pitcher. You get a double fine for that in Kangaroo Court. You had him 0 2. That's not good. Burn rule, the pitching coach is out to the mound. Now you've got to face Raphael for a call, top of the order. And those are sunflower seeds and not antacid tablets that Larry Boy is popping down there. Be it only for the moment. Phillies at 48 and 54. I spoke with Larry before the game, and he was uh, kind of understated. He, he just says that we have a young club and we're just inexperienced. Burn roll went to the mound. Again, we eavesdropped. Box sounds of the game. You don't need to strike everybody out. You're going to make them hit the ball there, you know? You get ahead, and then you try to try to mix them up. Make sure you know what you want to do here and just get them out, OK? Yeah. OK, you got the guy on first base. He's not going to run. Yeah. He's not running. Just make sure you get your eye on the hitter now. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. That's also something that Larry Boa talked about. He has young pitchers. He has talented pitchers. They're not very far off, but it seems like when they get a little adversity, a guy hit a home run or a guy hit the ball solidly somewhere, uh, they'll get a little bat shy and they're afraid to have the hitter put the ball into play. That's what Greg Maddox wants the hitter to do. He wants him to put the ball into play. And but that's basically what Vern Rula said. You don't have to strike everybody out, meaning put the ball in play, make a good pitch down in the zone. That's what Crash Davis told Nuke Lelouch, right? Mm -hmm. Strikeouts are boring. Besides that, they're fascist. Yep. Spread it out. Let your defense help you. Especially, although it hasn't been the case today, especially as well as the Phillies have played defense this year. Seven balls versus one strike over the just last two hitters that he's faced. Make it eight balls and one strike. And now there's a decision to make about whether or not you want Coggin to even continue here. Wes Helms is coming up. Carlos Silva in the bullpen. Larry Boa no doubt saying hurry. Uh, he just got going, so. Two strikeouts followed by two walks. 
all part of a master plan to make Chris Hammond run the bases, you see. <laughs> Tucker himself out. Now there you go. One to strike the count to Helms. Throw a lot of high fastballs, and if you're a curveball pitcher, especially one who has a good one like Coggin, it's a good idea to throw that early because to throw a good curveball, you have to get your arm out front and get over it. And sometimes that can be the pitch that corrects the high errant fastball. Mike Lieberthal, who again may well have saved the game at a couple of different points by doing exactly that last night. Just continues to absorb the baseball, absorb the punishment, and help these young pitchers work through it. That is not lost on uh, those pitchers to have the confidence to throw that ball down, especially with runners on. In the air to shallow right. And Silva, for now, can sit back down. Fox Sports, home of the 2002 postseason and World Series, returns after these messages from your local Fox station. Four two Braves are scored. The Braves have just had a wonderful year. We talked to John Smoltz about that. So to hear somebody say we've exceeded is kind of neat because in the last couple of years it's always been underachieved. You know, people thought that uh, the names and the talent sometimes outweighs the performance. And I think this year we have not hit all cylinders, and we have done everything you can do to win. You know, and I know there's probably a little slide at the end of the tunnel that we're probably going to go through, but. I think a lot of credit gives them, given our manager. Well, since 1990, there has been an air of inevitability surrounding these Atlanta Braves. No matter what the internal challenge, no matter who the division upstart may be in a given year, that ball dunked in a right. That's going to be a base hit for Jimmy Rollins. In the end, it's as sure as the sun coming up in the east. It does come up in the east, right? Mm -hmm. The Braves will go to the playoffs. Well, let's be honest about it. Uh, the the division is, is down this year. The, the Mets have sputtered. Uh, Florida, uh, with with their young pitching, you thought they were really going to step it up. They haven't. Phillies have struggled. So the timing has been great, and they haven't really scored a lot of runs. The, the offense, I'm talking about the Braves now, hasn't come around like they would like it to, but they have pitched so well. Their bullpen has pitched so well. They've played well in close games. Uh, that's what's really done it. Abreu bunting. Castilla, do or die. He will throw to first too late. The Phillies have two on, nobody out. And Bobby Abreu with 53 runs batted in, 32 doubles, 10 home runs. He's not thinking about power here. He's thinking about the bunt. Well, it's a nice play because Castillo is conceding the bunt. He's playing deep. And now the tying runs on first base. And it puts a lot of pressure on that bullpen to have to really wade through some of the Phillies best hitters like Burl and Roland. Rollins and Abreu each reaching for the first time today. And you're right now it gets to Burl and Roland and Lee and Lieberthal. Pitching change made Spoonie Barger coming on. It's four to two. Braves trying to hold off the Phillies. It's four to two. Tim Spooniebarger comes on. Now it's two on, nobody out. Pat Burl is the man at the plate. Pat Burl is the cleanup hitter. Pat Burl has zero sacrifice bunts in not just his major league career, but in his professional career. He has never laid one down. And he's got to be swinging it here as well as the guy in the on deck circle. He drives it to right center. Darren Bragg is going back on the track. Darren Bragg made the catch. He had the jet ski through that standing water. He went slamming against the wall. What a play he made. That's the replacement for Andrew Jones. He has no business making that catch. Craig, the little guy, gets really tall here, checking the wall twice. Great catch, especially when you consider the timing of it. First and second, nobody out with a two-run lead. 
That is what winning teams do. You have your reserve guy off the bench coming in, making a gold glove type play. Reducing Andrew Jones to and who Jones. How does some kind of play Darren Bragg with runners now at first and third for Scott Rowland. And a rude way to greet Tim Spooniebarger. Tell you what though the great play by uh, by Bragg uh, really sets up the double play Spooniebarger has a great moving fastball. And throw a lot of ground balls. And that play could have Spooniebarger one pitch away from getting out of this unscathed. There you go. Ground ball to the shortstop. There's one. There's two. And Darren Bragg pumps his fist as he comes off the field. He's the man that set it up with an amazing catch in right center field. Grain. And by new Lotrimin Ultra, there's only once a day cure for athlete's foot. Well, the fans still buzzing about the catch made by Darren Bragg, who reminds yeah. you a little bit, just to put it in Philly's parlance, of Lenny Dykstra. A scrappy little guy with plenty of heart. A Dykstra esque, if not Andrew Jones esque, play to help keep this game 4 to 2. Gary Sheffield one out of three with a double today. The two outs have been a hard hit. I guess the difference between Dykstra and Bragg. Dykstra called everybody dude. Mm -hmm. Bragg calls everybody man. That's really about it though. Yeah, it's, uh Strange dichotomy. <laughs> Hector Marcato in the Phillies bullpen. Sheffield taking three and one. I tell you, Gary Sheffield has to be incredibly strong. He hits a lot like uh, Julio Franco in that he really buggy whips the bat. Doesn't need to break it out. Draws the walk. And watch her. He's getting, he's getting it going there to bring the long way around the world route, but is so strong in the hands and wrists. You know, another uh, grave, two-time MVP, Dale Murphy had a lot of that buggy whip in his swing as well. The third walk by Coggin is going to be his last act. We'll tell you about the new pitcher in just a moment. When you can find a locksmith and tell your friends you're running. Dave Coggins' inability to throw strikes leads to his exit from the game. They will go ahead and turn around Chipper Jones. They will bring a lefty on to face him. The lefty in question is Hector Mercado. Numbers that uh, need to be certainly whittled down, especially in the earned run average department and in the walk department. 17 and two thirds innings of work with 13 walks, uh, way too excessive. So Larry Boa taking a bit of a chance after taking Coggin out for walking the leadoff hitter. Going with the lefty who has had some control difficulties. The Braves trying to pull away from this pesky Philadelphia team today. The Phillies able to win yesterday 3-2. to two. Chipper Jones was walked intentionally last time up. The time before that, he was swinging well. His 11th home run of the season. I think Larry Boa has seen two good at-bats from the left side out of Chipper Jones and uh, did not want to take the chance of uh, having him do it again. Bar! On the first, and they got him! Hector Mercado picking off Sheffield. Bobby Cox is out to argue the point. I don't know if you could hear it. Glenn Hubbard was yelling Bach as a first base coach. Sheffield certainly thought it was, and now Bobby Cox is going to try to sell the very same thing. 
It didn't look to be much there. And if, if any balk could have been called, it could have been on breaking the, the 45 degree line, having to step towards first, and he looked to be pretty well in order. Here's the look there. That's a, there's nothing tricky about that. It's a legit move. Didn't appear that Sheffield was actually revving up to go anywhere either. He just, he just kind of sat him down basically with that move. Two balls, no strikes, account to Chipper Jones. And it's funny because yesterday, the decision to go to first base for Mercado was a bad decision. He had a play at a home plate that allowed Atlanta's second run to score. And instead, he swiveled around and went on to first instead of coming home for the force, despite the catcher, Mike Lieberthal, basically bellowing, please, throw it here. Now the Braves reload. And again, the difference in the bullpens is pretty stark. We have seen five walks from the Philadelphia bullpen. Amazing. That's in just two plus innings. Nice hand for Darren Bragg as he comes to the plate right now. This is what the fans are remembering very fondly. And it was Andrew Jones who left with a dizzy spell, getting Bragg in the game in the first place. And Bragg goes ahead and rams the wall. Bobby Cox talked to how he had really had such great contributions from his bench. And any team ready in itself for the postseason has depth on the bench. You've got Bragg. Most games, you've got not one Franco, but two. You've got Matt, you've got Julio. The ageless wonder, Julio Franco. I think he's found the fountain of middle age, that's for sure. <laughs> Back to the net, one and two. He was beginning to fess up, by the way. He no longer shakes his head vigorously when you drop a 43 years old on him, which is... That's probably because he's gotten beyond that. <laughs> and uh, it's a compliment to him. General Manager John Sherholz was not shy about bringing him in right at the end of August last year. Two balls, two strikes to count to Bragg. Well-traveled now, too. Having played for seven major league teams, close for teams in Mexico, Japan, and Korea. Economize all of that, and you get professional hitter. He came up as a Philadelphia Philly way back when. Came up with Ryan Sandberg in the Philly system in the early 80s. And Franco essentially the reason that Sandberg became the Chicago Cub when that trade was orchestrated. Larry Bowe was a part of that deal, by the way. And Dallas Green, the general manager, was holding out for the Phillies to include Sandberg as a throw in in that deal. And Philly did that because they already had Juan Samuel and Julio Franco. That ball tapped to third. Backing up Roland. There's one. So if it had been Sam Well and not Franco, too, the Phillies would have kept Sandberg instead. But because they were so deep up the middle, that's why they went ahead and dealt away Sandberg, who was actually a third baseman at the time. Hard to believe that John Sherholtz acquired last year Julio Franco from the Mexican League for just a pair of World Series tickets. Were they good seats? I would hope so, <laughs> just to try to make them feel good about the deal. It's one of the best deals John Sherholtz has made. And he's made a lot of them. I was going to say, it's a pretty long list. Castilla hits the bag with that one. And that is actually a break. For the Philadelphia Phillies, had that ball gotten down in the corner, you're talking runners at second and third. We have seen some serious pinball played here today. And you know, Josh, could have been a little bit beyond runners at second and third. 
Craig may have uh, scored on it. It gets to rattling around in the corner, you never know. Looks like Mark DeRosa has grabbed a bat. This is Keith Lockhart's turn to hit with a lefty on the mound. Bobby Cox will go and get the second Penn Quaker into this game. Doug Glanville is already playing. Now we see Mark DeRosa. A couple of Ivy Leaguers. Yeah, the league is uh, literally littered with them. We say that facetiously, of course, but Bobby Cox says that Mark DeRosa, all he can do is hit. He's become one of the more popular players on this Atlanta ball club. We get Remlinger in this game. You're talking about the Ivy League trifecta. He's a Dartmouth guy. Somebody hurries up and trades for Brad Osmus. We got the pick four. Yeah, Remlinger for a left-hander is pretty smart. <laughs> two on, two out, 4-2 game. With Greg Maddox on the mound, we sure got to say 0-1 a lot. We have not been saying that out loud a lot at all ever since he left the game. The relievers on both sides have opened up 1-0, 2-0 quite a bit. to strike the count to DeRosa and if you look ahead to the eighth inning Lee Lieberthal and Anderson coming up for Philadelphia and the Phillies have actually had some very decent production from the bottom of the order today Lee a couple of hits has been on base three times Lieberthal has reached twice Anderson has an RBI single One one from Mercado. Make it two and one. Atlanta bolting out to a four nothing lead this afternoon. The Phillies chip back with two in the sixth. Had a threat going in the seventh inning, but could not cash in. Bases are loaded. That would have been an unbelievable play. I'll tell you what, you take a real chance in even throwing that ball. If it gets away, you've got a run coming in. Well, you do because Marlon Anderson has already done the good thing by keeping this ball from going to the outfield. So he's already saved a run. Now he risks by throwing this, of uh, throwing it away. And, and in essence, Allowing a run to score when he already prevented it by knocking it down. Risking his third error of the afternoon. Bases are loaded for Blanco. The bases are loaded despite the ball not getting out of the infield yet in this inning. reaches it goes to Franco Julio has stepped out on deck by well, the way the Braves bullpen has pitched this year another run or two would be dandy for them Rip he didn't get it 0 and 2 Blanco has had some big hits for this Atlanta team this year, five of his 15 runs batted in have been game-winning RBI. This would qualify as a big RBI. Try to break it open. Two strike, two out pitch. Down too low, and Lieberthal saves another one. He just looks so natural going to block those pitches. Uh, the angles uh, remain great to where he keeps his chest protector basically pointed out towards the pitching mound. If he's going to get a high hop, he'll still be able to keep it in front of him. A lot of catchers, when they go into the block mode, they get hard deflections. But with uh, with Lieberthal, everything seems to be soft 
right out in front of him. With the bases loaded. That one is right there for strike three call. The Braves have stranded eight in their last three innings. That keeps the Phillies hanging around. It is four to two. More changes in this game. We have kind of grown accustomed to changes in this game. Mark DeRosen stays in, plays second base. So Keith Lockhart is done. And the 7-0, Mike Remlinger, the possessor of the best earned run average of any reliever in the National League. Uh, he will now become the fourth Atlanta pitcher trying to protect a 4-2 lead. Remember, Greg Maddox started this game. He threw a season-high 100 pitches. And since then, it's been Hammond, Spoonie Barger, and now Remlinger to go get Lee. He doesn't get him. Travis Lee pegs one into the corner. And Lee is on his way to second base. And now he's going to go on to third. Throw is well offline, and that is not something you see every day. But Travis Lee thunders in a third base with a leadoff triple. Tell you, the Braves have just not been able to put any distance between the Phillies. And Travis Lee going up against a pitcher who's been so dominant out of the bullpen this year, doesn't want to wait around to get the fastball, gets a strike breaking ball. Here they come again. Third consecutive hit for Travis Lee. Two singles, now a triple. And the infield is back here. Braves needing six outs to get a win. Lieberthal looking like he's trying to get it to the right side. It fouls it out of play. We mentioned Mike Lieberthal, kind of the stealth star of the game last night, saving three or four wild pitches with a one-run lead. He has smothered some more that almost got away in this one this afternoon. Remlinger hangs it outside, a one and one. And the Braves did make a move today regarding their bullpen. Darren Holmes is back off the DL. They have had to put another pitcher on the DL. As that ball is twirled out of play. Kevin Grabowski goes to the disabled list. He's got a sore elbow. You see the closer getting up here in the eighth inning, John Smoltz. And the thing about the Braves bullpen, they really give you a lot of different looks. Spoonie Barker has a, the hard cutter. Grabowski has the hard sinker. Holmes the curveball. Hammond the changeup. Smoltz <laughs> has all of the above. A foul ball. And the count still one and two. And now it's a matter of getting it to John Smoltz, who has been just money over the last two, two and a half months. Well, it's uh, it's about basically trading one run for three outs to get it to John Smoltz. And who knows, uh, he may be coming in here in the top of the eight. He already has a franchise record for most wins in a single season. Freezing the runner. And Remlinger throws out Lieberthal. Smoltz now with a chance to set a major league record for most saves if all goes well. The transformation that Smoltz has made from a starter to a closer really has been a remarkable one in how quick he's been able to do it. He's such a competitor and can pitch, meaning that he can make quality pitches to go with that great stuff. I think the educational process for him, he realized he doesn't have to throw every pitch 98. It's just like starting. Location, location, location. Smothered it by DeRosa. Close play. Got him at first. The run comes in. 
But that's a big out and Marlon Anderson with some parting comments over the shoulder. He does get credit for a run batted in. This is now a 4-3 game. Great play. Looks like off the bat that there's no way once the ball gets by the first baseman that the Braves are going to be able to get an out here. But they traded for a run, and that's absolutely what they would be delighted to do. And gets into that situation where it's counting outs and having the best closer in the bullpen. A frustrated Marlon Anderson does have two runs batted in today. Tomas Perez will come up to pinch hit. I'll tell you, the Braves' replacements are making gold star defensive plays. Darren Bragg was in for Andrew Jones, and he may have saved the game for Atlanta with that play he made in right center. Now DeRosa able to make that play on Marlon Anderson. Talked to Bobby Cox today, and he said, our role players have been absolutely fantastic. Glavin's been Glavin, Smoltz, Maddox. Uh, Gary Sheffield obviously has been a great addition. But the DeRosas, Braggs, and people filling out those, those other, other roles really have been spectacular. And there's been a great story right there. Matt Franco came into the game hitting 364. Up to a high three and one at Perez. And already it's been a strange inning in that Remlinger has been scored upon. The leadoff triple by Travis Lee. Way, way out in front, three and two. Look at the delivery of Remlinger. He has a, a nice little side saddle start to his windup, but his arm seems to stay behind his body until, boom, right at the end. And although he is quick, it's uh, sneaky as well. Trying for the outside corner, and he just missed. That looked good. <laughs> Of course, Matt Hollowell was not calling this pitch uh, to Greg Maddox. I think you got to make him swing the bat there. Well, the two bullpens have combined to walk eight. It's a game that was started by Greg Maddox, the master of the pinpoint control. Top of the order, Doug Glanville trying to change his luck today. 0 for 4. And loving those retro threads, by the way. Grew up a Phillies fan. These are the uniforms he grew up rooting for. Bo Diaz used to wear that number. The late Bo Diaz, number six. Two balls, no strikes. And we've taken Glenville to task a little bit today for his refusal to take up there at the plate. He's usually up there hacking, but here in a big spot. He grows the count in his favor. It's 2-0. Oh. Now he swings and he pops it up. Will it stay in play for Helms? He's going over. Makes the catch to render Glanville 0 for 5. Bottom of the eighth coming up. The Phillies have gotten closer. This game is 4-3. Never lets you down and make it a Bud Light. Now for the Phillies today, it's been Joe Roa, Real Cormier, David Coggin, Hector Mercado, and now it is Ijo Silva. Carlos Silva, the fifth Philly pitcher today in a 4-3 game. Well, we heard the sounds of the game early when Vern Rule took Roa out of the game, so we have some guys in the bullpen that need to get work, and he wasn't kidding. <laughs> Brings in the fifth pitcher. The Braves... Braves, Joe, have gone through four, and there will be a fifth. You figure John Smoltz to come on and close it. This is really starting to shape up like a typical Atlanta Braves game. The bullpen has been active. They've been early. They've been in the game early. And as you mentioned, looks like Smoltz is coming in there. 
First, a cameo from Julio Franco. 43 years young. Julio Franco's got a little of that uh, Gary Sheffield uh, bat pointing going. Career 300 hitter, he can do whatever he wants to up there. Well, if you're a pitcher watching the bat, as uh, you know, good pitchers do, you think by how he readies himself or how he has the bat cocked that he has to go the long way around and loop it to get back into the hitting zone that you can throw him inside. And I know from personal experience that it's not a good thing to do. One ball, two strikes to count to him. One of the heaviest bats in the major leagues, too. He has the strength to swing it. Early in his career, really rededicated himself, got into the weights. Came very strong, very strong in the hands and forearms, always has been. And look, he has the bat cocked here to where he's got to go all the way back around. But so quick. That's with a 36-ounce bat that he's had quick. Two and two. And he looks like a contortionist up there when he starts out. It looks like it's painful. Well, he's got the bat loaded, and you try to go in there, and he can make it hurt. Three balls, two strikes, as he's worked all the way back here in the count. Because it, it belies common sense that the guy has to take that long of a route to get back to the ball and to still get into a place where most hitters have a hard time getting extension. That's how quick he is. Yet another walk. This one of the leadoff variety. Time for a game break. We go say hello to Jeannie again in L.A. Hi, Josh. Still working hard at Shea. The Mets try to rejoin the playoff race, and the Reds keep getting in the way. Top 11, Todd Walker. Singles home, Austin Kearns Walker, three for four as a pinch hitter this season. The Reds out in front, 2-1, top 11. All right, Jeannie, thank you very much. Those two teams very much alive, chasing the wild card possibility. And the Reds have been good away from home this year. For call, popping one up. The Cincinnati Rhodes. <laughs> Trying to win one at Shea today. Philly's trying to rally and win one here, but first things first, they've got to make sure the Braves don't make it five to three or six to three. I'll tell you, the occasional strike would really help. The Phillies bullpen today has thrown more balls than strikes officially. Goes to what Larry Boa was talking about, that he, he likes his pitching staff. He thinks his pitching staff is talented. It's a, it's a bit inexperienced. And when they have a little duress, give up a home run, a hard hit ball somewhere, they become a little shy of the bat and start pitching around the zone as opposed to aggressively in it. Well, you know, for a call is up there bunting. You got to throw him a strike to get through this. 39 balls, 36 strikes out of the Philadelphia bullpen today. Just popped up. No play. It's one and two, and Willie Bunt with two strikes. I don't see why not. It's a tough pitch to Bunt, though. Fastball in the mid-90s above the belt. Riding fastball. It's tough to get on the ground. The Phillies were a one-run winner yesterday. Braves trying to extend a one-run lead right now. Bottom of the eighth inning. Swinging, it is still one and two. No, Atlanta has not lost a series. Two game, three game, four game, whatever. Since early May. 22 series in a row without losing one of them. The major league record is 24. And the Braves have to win this one. And tomorrow's game to extend that streak. Two balls, two strikes. 
they had that so-so start and the Phillies got buried early at 8 and 18. But they have really, really turned it around. 47 and 16. Look at the earned run average. Wow. Showing the bunt with two strikes. Three and two the count. We have seen ever since Joe Rowe left the game. A walk in the fifth, two in the sixth, two in the seventh. In danger of two in the eighth. You get the feeling Larry Boa has seen this movie before. <laughs> Franco's going. And it is pumped out of play by Percal. Boy, lip readers must have a field day with Larry Bowen. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure they, uh, they're they blushing right now, too. <laughs> a seven-pitch at bat. As for call, is trying to move along Franco. A look ahead to the top of the ninth. Jimmy Rollins leading off to set up Abreu and Burl and Roland. Well, he doesn't have a count of the balls and strikes that you profiled, but uh, he knows it hasn't been good. Again, the runner goes, and again a foul ball. If Silva ends up walking for a call, you might see an eruption of Vesuvius proportions from Larry Bowen. It would be like a, like a volcano. Uh, yeah, kind of like that, right? Nothing gets past my partner. Nothing. <laughs> Three, two. We will do it again. Two hitters in this inning. 16 pitches. Putting a lot of pressure on the pitching. For Philadelphia, 3-2 count, foul off some more. They had the, the, the continuing theme for the bullpen today has been their inability to throw strikes. So the call's doing a good job. Larry Bowen knows with Smoltz probably coming into the ball game that they cannot afford to give up another run. Here comes pitch number 10. Again, Franco goes, and this ball put in play. It'll score it in a right field. Franco stopped them. Now he'll motor towards third. I don't know if he was deeped by Rollins or what, but he just stopped and was a spectator and realized the ball was actually in right field. Well, I think he was also going station to station, thinking that the second baseman's going to, going to get a handle on it. And he doesn't want to round the bag at second to have Anderson wheel and throw behind him. in advancing years. Maybe he's just conserving his energy. <laughs> A little bit winded as it's now first and third. Still nobody out. And barring a triple play, you figure something positive is about to happen here for Atlanta. Wes Helms came into the game in the fifth inning. He doubled right away. Braves out hitting the Phillies 10 to 9 at this point. And if Helms doesn't get it done, Gary Sheffield advances to the plate next. Because if you're Bobby Cox, the only thing you really don't want here is a ground ball back to the mound or to one of the infielders who are now in a little bit. Keep in mind the Braves stranded three in the fifth, two more in the sixth, three again in the seventh. Leaving on a total of eight over the last three innings. Oh, one is cranked foul. Larry Boa, I'm sure, is having a tough time believing what he's seeing. The scoreboard actually says 0 oh, and 2. The bullpen has not produced that a lot. I think he's shaking his head realizing that the Braves have a chance to score here and um, more than likely will with the game's best closer ready to come in. Yanked but fell. So in other words it does not look good. 
but you could really do yourself a favor if you're Carlos Silva by getting a hard hit ground ball right at somebody here or just go ahead and strike out Helms let Sheffield hit it hard right at somebody. Got him. 96 mile an hour heat. Now he will be looking for that double play from Sheffield. Boy, that's a good time to break out your best fastball. That's the fastest pitch he has thrown all afternoon. And he saved it with two strikes when he really needed a, a punch out to get that extra home fun. One of the leading suppliers of oomph now at the plate. That is Gary Sheffield. And a fly ball of any depth will open things up. Well, this is money time. Let's see how he does. Line shot to left. The money ball is number 11. You know, Josh, he has hit uh, some bolts today, and the two best balls he has hit have gone for outs. One of them deflecting off the glove of, of Roa earlier in the ball game to be caught by Rollins, the shortstop. And this ball, in many ways, catches Pat Burrow. Chipper Jones. Taking strike one. Chipper has walked twice. He's also blasted a home run. I'll tell you though, it's not a slam dunk, even with Smoltz coming out for the ninth. Two, three, four in the order coming up to set up Scotty Rowland. And again, as we've been talking about all day, the possibility surely exists. This could be the Final hours or final days of Scott Rowland in Philadelphia. One and two to Chipper Jones. Cardinals talking trade with the Phillies. But if the Cardinals land him, the talk is they want to make sure that it's a long term situation, not a rent a player. So I'd imagine that. Scott's agents are busy this afternoon. Chipper Jones has looked a, a lot more comfortable at the plate than he has the past few weeks. Came into the game with just 10 home runs. He has one today. Gary Pendleton had even brought in Chipper's father, Larry, who he says knows his swing as, uh, as well as anyone to work with him. They may have to bring Larry out onto the field just to pop up Chipper, who was beginning to atrophy up there at the plate. Silva not exactly eager to throw this next pitch. Well, what he was doing, he was arching his back that way, and now he is more engaged as opposed to arching his back and really get into all kinds of bad habits. 96 but outside two and two. Just about any other player you're not talking about a down year if you're hitting 305 with 11 home runs. There's high expectations on Chipper Jones for a reason. Two 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 out pitch. Did he check his swing. Yes he did check his swing three and two. By the way we invite you to show your support for your favorite team with the MLB authentic collection. You can log on to MLB.com to order your player quality merchandise. Right now. In fact,
fact, you've probably got time to do it during this at bat. <laughs> the 3 2. One more time. We have seen some long at bats this afternoon. This is war and peace. Chipper chant beginning out of sheer boredom at this point. Ball four. Two walks in the eighth, two walks in the seventh, two walks in the sixth. I tell you, I've seen some good pitches uh, and not called strikes. That was a really good pitch. glowering in as if to say with his body language are you sure about that and that one missed one and oh to brag the starting pitcher Joe Roa four innings no walks. the bullpen has coughed up seven brag with a foul ball If the Braves leave on a couple more, that is to say if Bragg doesn't come through here, that would make 10 runners left on base. In the last four innings for Atlanta, they've really had chances, Joe, to make this game a rout. And that has not happened. Back to the net, one and two. Five runs, ten hits, one error for Atlanta. Three, nine, and two for the Phillies. Greg Maddox online for his tenth win. Joe Roa, who was 14 and 0 at Triple A, would get the loss. Another nice stop by Lieberthal. <laughs> and more muttering from Larry Boa in that Phillies dugout. Who would have put a mic on Larry Boa today? But our fear was that. It might have just melted right off his body. Or that none of it would have made any made it to air. <laughs> Three and two. We'll see if the walkathon continues or not. Runners will be in motion. Vinny Castilla is on deck. Now the payoff. It is slugged to center field. Glanville turning. And the curtain will finally slam shut. Glanville ducking out of the way of some people throwing something on the field. It's five to three. Aaron Bragg is very much part of the reason it is five to three Atlanta. Our great feat of the game brought to you by New Lotrim and Ultra. The only once a day cure for athlete's foot. Shoulder first into the wall. That was with two on and nobody out. The great feat of the game. Julio Franco stays in the game playing first. And yes, John Smoltz is on the mound. Even he opens up with ball one. It is a serious affliction here today. Smoltz with outstanding stuff. Great competitor. High 90s fastball. A lot of riding action on it. One of the best sliders in the game. Split finger fastball. All power pitches. And look at the strikeouts. He has been dominant through 54 and two thirds innings of work. And only 18 walks. That ball seemed to zigzag in on Jimmy Rollins. One and two. He's got that gravity defying slider where it looks like it's deflecting off an object, taking that quick left turn. Left center field. It'll be a right turn towards the dugout for Jimmy Rollins. By the way, the coordinating producer of Fox Baseball, Michael Weissman. Today's game produced by Carol Langley McDermott. Directed by Ray Tipton. Associate Director Kathy Hunt. 
broadcast associate Zach Fields, the technical producer Matt Benedict, coordinating producer of the studio show Scott Ackerson. Today's pregame show produced by Gary Lang, directed by Bob Levy. The senior producer of Fox Sports is Bill Brown. The executive producers are Ed Gorin and David Hill. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to Ethan Cooperson, Stats Maven. That's what it says right on the business card, Stats Maven. Smoltz to Bobby Abreu. Two balls, no strikes, and an audible ooh from the crowd. Now stay away from that uh, that outside corner. It hasn't been it hasn't been very wide since Mark Hirschbeck left the game. Matt Hollowell replaced him. Seven mile an hour get me over 2 0 fastball. <laughs> Must be nice. Leading the major leagues in saves with 37. He's getting close to number 38. 2 and 2. I'll tell you, this slider 88, 89 miles an hour, it just disappears. Look at the late tight break with fastball tilt. That's illegal. Two two delivery. Good night. Two down. Back to back sliders to a very good hitter. Making a very good hitter look bad. That slider has such tight spin on it that it looks like a fastball. You can't pick it up until it's too late. Pat Burl to the plate trying to keep the game going. On deck, could it be for the last time as a Philadelphia Philly? Here's Scott Rowland, who, by the way, homered off of John Smoltz to tie a game earlier this year back in Philadelphia. And if Burl gets on, Rowland has a chance for a little bit of deja vu. You see the, the delivery of Smoltz. Right when he is, before he even releases it, it's like you're going to get something really quick. And I don't think you're going to be able to tune it up a notch to get it. 97. This is impressive. Fastball, slider. Now he's got Burl thinking. Burl in danger of striking out for the fourth time today. Strikeout day. Roland does not bat. Smoltz another save. And we bid you a fond farewell. Atlanta five and Philadelphia three. Chipper Jones a home run. Darren Bragg had that big play in the outfield. Major League Baseball on Fox continues next Saturday. The Braves against the Cardinals or other regional action. For more info on today's game and for the latest in Major League Baseball news, log on to FoxSports.com. For Joe McGrain, Josh Lewin is saying so long from Atlanta. Again, your final score was 5-3 Braves. You've been watching Fox Sports coverage of Major League Baseball, the exclusive home of the 2002 World Series.